Hello and welcome to another session of The Change Exchange. My guest today is Sam Bick Bessinger. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to meet you. Yeah, also. Sam's been all over the news and the uh, social pages, not social pages, <laughs> social media, because of a book which made history because the uh, publisher has never put anything like that on the cover. <laughs> Sam, so manage your money like a fucking grown-up. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? What did you do before this? Uh, so I'm essentially a tech entrepreneur and I've, I'm a writer. Um, and over the last sort of five to ten years, both of those things, what I've started building technology around and also writing about has been about money and specifically humans and money and the emotional being and the emotional creature um, and how we interact with money. And so I've been building tools and apps to help make that easier for people um, and this is the sort of culmination this book is a, a summary of all the stuff I've learned um, but you started out studying creative writing I did at UCT yeah um, what was the picture in your head where were you going <laughs> I wanted to be a writer always um, of fiction yeah so um, it's very it's it's been quite a journey to get from someone who basically um, thought of myself as a very uh, I suppose right brained person like an entirely creative person person um, who was terrified of money, found it very uninteresting as well. Um, the last thing I would ever have thought of studying would have been finance. Um, and, uh, you know, what I always wanted to do was to write fiction, um, but that kind of got me to a place where um, I needed to learn about money for myself. And uh, learning about money from that angle of um, someone who doesn't think it that way naturally, mm -hmm. um, and had to learn, had to learn some hard lessons as well. Um, you said in an interview, in my early 20s, I had so many self-limiting narratives yeah. about money. I chose jobs I hated because I was terrified of being broke. Yeah. And then I went and overspent and got into debt to, to, to try the, to fill the hole of how miserable those jobs were making me. <laughs> you say, past me was a dumbass. Past me was such a dumbass. <laughs> like, so, I mean, this Tell is, me about that story. Oh, such, I mean, it's, you so know. you took jobs because yeah. you needed to earn money. Absolutely. Jobs like what? So you come out of the world with a degree in creative writing. And I think my degree was actually, it was creative writing and religious studies because... Not know, very saleable. Not very sellable. And, it, you know, you go out into the world world, a bright eyed, you know, sort of young person, very idealistic, what jobs can you actually get? Yeah. Uh, so I ended up working in advertising. And I, I was lucky that the ad agency I ended up working at is an amazing one with an amazing culture. But even then, it's something that just never sat right with me. It was something that I never had wanted to get into. Um, and although I loved everyone I worked with and learned a lot about the world, I learned a bit about business. It was just the entire life that I was living felt like it was someone else's life. Um, and it, it's weird how all of these things kind of, um, you know, every choice you make, which is ostensibly about money, is, is a choice about what you value. It's a choice about life, right? And I was making all of these choices down to where I lived, what car I drove, what job I was working. And they're all connected, right? Um, and they were all making me really profoundly miserable. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it took me a long time to realize that the reason that I was so unhappy was because my entire financial plan at that point was never think about it, but also, oh shit, I'd better earn lots of money, I suppose, um, as much so as I can. So what made you realize that I must do something about, I must change something? So I was actually, I was lucky enough that while working this ad job, um, a lot of my clients increasingly were financial services clients. And um, one of the things I'm really good at doing um, is I'm really good at interviewing people. So I, I was working as a designer, essentially, which means what I would do is I would interview people about how they thought about money. And then I would try to design interfaces and communicate back to them um, kind of, you know, from the, the complex world of finances in ways that would make sense to the normal people that I was interviewing. Right. Um, and in doing that, what was so great is I was getting to spend time with these finance people people. And I learned that this whole world that I'd, I'd had all these emotional blocks around and refused to engage with wasn't as complicated as I thought it was. That actually the principles around how do you save, how do you invest, how do you keep your money safe are simple. Um, although there's an enormous amount of, of nonsense and rent seeking and 
uh, and really like terrible behavior in the financial services industry, there are increasingly people making it easier, right? Mm. So mm. kind of it was playing that role as translator between the financial services industry and regular people. And in doing that, I sort of one day realized that I had learned things that I needed to know. And there was kind of a bit of a Damascus moment one day driving to work. And I, I, I sort of pulled my car off the road and I burst into tears thinking about how my life didn't feel like my life. And it almost got so bad that I was like, I need, I need to, I need to change it because if this is how I'm going to live, you know, this is, this isn't, this was never the plan. This is where, where, where's kind of the freedom that I wanted and, and mm. you know, the creativity and all of that and living life on my own terms. And kind of, it, it, I'd been lucky enough that I kind of had internalized all of these messages in my job around how does one liberate oneself you know, financially to be able to do things, that the timing was right, that I realized actually you can write a different mm. script. There is a different script to, um, be, you know, put your head down at a job that you're terrified of losing um, and then somehow spend all of the money you make because you're trying to like, you know, <laughs> live this middle class life with all of its trappings. So what did you do the next day? The next day I quit my job. <laughs> um, I quit my job, I decided to move overseas. Did you, did you know, where, did you have a plan? No. Where did the plan come I've from? I've never had a plan at all. Um, I, I didn't have a plan, I quit my job with no plan. Um, I applied for um, a bunch of fellowships and, and things, which I thought would give me time to think. I was lucky enough to get one of them, which was the uh, Nelson Mandela uh, Fellowship for Young African Leaders. Um, and I got to That's go to- in Washington. Yeah, well, uh, it's actually, they place you at a university uh, for six weeks and then you go to Washington. So I, I got to go to Yale, which was amazing. And the most amazing part of the program, or thing about the program was that uh, they'd chosen 500 exceptional young people from across the continent of Africa. And so being at Yale was cool. There were old buildings. It was nice, whatever. But <laughs> what was amazing is that I was there in a class with 24 other exceptional young people from other countries in Africa. Uh, there were people from uh, the Gambia, from Cameroon, from Nigeria, from Kenya. and. How did, learned... you, how did you experience that? Because we, we still in South Africa, don't really feel ourselves part of this con continent. And we absolutely are. Um, and I learned more from those people than from any lecturer at Yale. And what was so fascinating and amazing for me was this incredible sense of optimism and energy um, about the fact that in all of these countries, and South Africa included, right, we, we have such real problems to be solving. We're living in societies filled with such inequality um, but that we have this generation of young people growing up who's increasingly well educated, increasingly it, it has the whole world at, their, at our fingertips, um, who have a responsibility and the ability to fix problems in our countries. Um, and I was just so entirely inspired by them. And they kind of inspired me to turn my own angst back on myself and think like, what has been this, the real source of so much of my misery? It's actually been this sense of being trapped in a life in a middle class narrative that doesn't make sense to me because how, you need the paycheck you need the paycheck and that drives every other decision so how can i go back to my country and help other people who are younger versions of myself and in so doing help myself really let's just look at that decision for a moment because there was a possibility to stay in America of you course, were yeah. in San Francisco yeah. you said for a for yeah. a year yeah so and then why the decision that you want to be I mean you were yeah. in Silicon Valley yeah it's oh, the, the heart heartland of, of tech absolutely so, heaven. <laughs> so I'd been kind of moving sideways into technology for for a while and I had a real interest in tech because it's a space where people solve problems um, and being in Silicon Valley absolutely I thought maybe this is the solution to all of my misery. I'll upend myself, I'll go across the world. Um, and what was so surprising is how much I hated San Francisco. <laughs> um, it felt like poor man's Cape Town, basically. Um, what was very frustrating for me about um, being in Silicon Valley is it was a collection of the smartest people that I'd met with the most, uh, so well-funded, like everything there, there's so much privilege. Um, mm -hmm. And what were the problems that they were working on solving? They were building apps to disrupt laundry 
or to help you know, already very wealthy, well-off people in San Francisco live even better lives. And it was so frustrating to me. Um, so the company I was working for uh, in San Francisco was Western Union. I was working at their digital arm. And Western Union uh, are a company that deal with remittances to and from Africa. So um, young people who've left, left the world and are sending money back home in those economic bonds. And I was doing a lot of interviews with people about the families they were supporting back home. Um, and it, it just everything about it made me just so like list to come back home. Just like I just missed home. I missed being in a place where the problems are real, the problems are in front of us, and there's so little legacy infrastructure holding us back. Like where we, your life would make a difference. Exactly. Huh? Yeah. yeah. But also we're building even in the tech space where we're so free to, to, to innovate because mm. it's not like in America where you're disrupting centuries old organizations, you know, like in the financial services mm. space. In South Africa, everything is so new and so, so open. open. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So when you came back, uh, did you settle in Johannesburg? Uh, no. So I, I did feel like I needed a bit of a change of scenery and I'd been living in Joburg before I left. Um, I love Joburg deeply. It's a wonderful, wonderful city. Um, but just I'd been in such a bad space when I was there that mm. it was a place that was a bit, it was tainted for me and I felt like I needed to come somewhere a bit different. Um, I already had a lot of friends living in Cape Town because I went to university here. So it felt like a natural place to try settle that had a little bit of change of scenery but was still connected to South Africa. Um, and so yeah, I've been here ever since and, and, and so did, happy. <laughs> did you come back to a job? No, no, I came back to unemployment, um, which was terrifying. <laughs> I, uh, the theme here is I don't make plans. Um, I, uh, I started working for a company called 227. Um, they were an amazing startup. They still are an amazing startup, although they're not so much of a startup anymore. They're quite mature now. Um, and it's basically an app that helps uh, the middle class in South Africa, the emerging middle class, manage their finances. And it's a, it's a set of really simple, easy to understand tools. And it was, um, it was the perfect place to take um, you know, all of the stuff that I'd, I'd, I'd sort of been carrying around um, and, and start to work on, on solving it. Like how can mm. we build an interface for money that makes money make sense to regular people like me who are trying to avoid it, right? Um, and why do why do we have that instinct that I don't <laughs> want to think about it? It's it's too, fear, what right? What is that emotion? Yeah. So I mean, I've, I've, every person um, I've spoken to uh, about how they manage their finances, you start off with very, you know, they start talking about very uh, basic things that are very tangible, like oh, I take, you know, I have this bank account and this credit card, and I move this there, and five minutes in anyone, you're talking about your emotions, you're talking about your family, you're talking about how did you learn these lessons. Mm -hmm. so the thing about money is it's not something we learn at school. It's not something that, uh, and that's a huge problem, I think. We, we don't learn about money the same way we learn about biology or mathematics or trigonometry. Mm -hmm. It's something we learn in our homes from our families by watching those around us. And often it's something we learn from advertising. And having been someone who was on that side, you know, the, uh, we, you, you, you internalize these messages from the world and there's really problematic narratives you internalize, um, many of us. So money was something in my uh, family. Problematic, uh, you must have this in order to be happy. So on both sides, right? Yeah. So from advertising, that's what you're getting. You're getting these, these really like unthought through ideas implanted in your head, like yeah. you have to have this kind of car to be a serious grown up. You have to have this kind of thing to be happy. And those are ideas that are implanted in our brains that aren't our own ideas, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, there are people who are quite strategically sitting down <laughs> thinking about how to implant those ideas yes. in our brains. Um, and on the other side, the kind of, you know, the lessons we learn that more are explicitly about money um, are often, you know, in, in my case, it was money in my family was something that we never spoke about. We never spoke about it. And when it was we, bad manners to talk about money. Very bad manners. And the only time that money did then come up was in moments of crisis and, and moments where money was something to be terrified of because it had run out. Yeah. And um, so the messages I internalized from that was messages of fear and and I think that's true for a lot of people but what we don't get really uh, enough positive models about are what are the what are the ways that you can use money as a tool 
And some people who mm. are lucky enough to grow, in, uh, grow up in families where there is entrepreneurship, where mm. there's there's a sense of calm and control over money. Mm. I think they are communicating. And money is money is seen as an as an instrument, exactly, as something you can a tool, exactly, something you can use to achieve things, exactly. Yeah. But that's not true for a lot of yeah. families. And it's also worth bearing in mind that in South Africa, 80% of our population was completely barred from the financial services industry until incredibly recently. So they just isn't the knowledge about how these instruments and tools in the financial services industry can be used. And it means that specifically young black South Africans are incredibly vulnerable to being sold credit cards, for instance, or store loans um, that can have a huge negative impact over their lifetime. Um, so, you know, we, we like my one of the reasons I really wanted to write this book was to sort of create a very simple structure and a counter narrative, mm -hmm. something that I wish I'd been given as a young person of here are some ways that you can use money positively in your life um, that are simple, simple principles. So how did you make this space in, in your own life, in time? to do this because writing a book is takes time. No, it really does. Um, so, I mean, what was great, the thing that is the most time consuming about writing a book, um, as you know, is the is the research, is the, the putting, putting mm. having the experiences to put it together. And I had, you know, this was so in line with what I was doing in my yes. job that I'd assembled a really clear sort of sense of what I wanted to say yeah. doing that. The time to actually uh, do the writing itself, um, I one of the things I learned I really value in jobs is flexible time. So it was something that I made sure I had in my job. Mm. Um, and so I essentially took off a month. I, I rented a very tiny little cottage in a tiny village in Stroud, which is in the Cotswolds. Um, it was a 500 year old little cottage. It was very cute. I uh, locked myself off and, and I wrote most of the book in, in that month, basically. How did, why did you feel that you had to get away? I mean, that <laughs> far away. Couldn't you just have gone to Colfinia? Probably. <laughs> no, if I did it again, I would definitely go to Colfinia. Um, I was in London anyway for, for work, oh. and so it was a it was a it felt like a, an interesting change of scenery. Mm. I realized I learned one of the things I do value is I, I the world is a big place, and while I, it's so important to me to feel connected and that South Africa is my home, um, I've learned that instead of traveling and doing the tourist thing, what I really love doing is taking times when I am working in other cities, um, and I've done that in a number of ways um, but that's something I far more enjoy I really enjoy living for a short mm. period of time in a place um, mm. and it felt like that was that was a way to do that so you know I would I had a I had a routine I had a life I would yeah. like wake up in the morning go to the little village yes. market buy my cheese lay it was <laughs> cheese <laughs> um, that's yeah but you are a non-financial person yes. giving very yeah financial Advice. Yes. Is that a bit scary? It is. Um, and luckily, I, you know, it takes a village to create a book. And luckily, I have <laughs> <laughs> surrounded myself with advisors. Mm. Um, so when there's a particularly thorny or difficult uh, concept, I do have lots of people I can check in with. But I regard the fact that I don't, I'm not a finance person. I never studied finance. Um, I don't come from that industry. I regard that as a positive because one of the things about the financial services industry is that it's filled with jobs. Mm. Um, you used the word translate yes, earlier, yeah. and I think that is that's what you're doing. Exactly, you're translating between from a different language often. So much to yeah. us, yeah, ordinary people. I mean, you take a word like mm. risk, right? Mm. Now, what, one of my bugbears is that um, people in the financial services industry talk about risk, high risk, and low risk investments a lot. Um, and they mean something very, very different to what ordinary people think risk means, right? Yeah. If I say to you, do you want to take your like hard earned money and put it on a high risk investment? You're gonna be like, no, definitely not, this is mine. Um, and this leads to people making a lot of mistakes, mm. right? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a language problem, it's a communication problem. But I also think it's one of those things that just makes people afraid. It makes mm. people afraid and feel like money is something that you have to have a degree to understand. I think I think learning about finances is a lot like learning how to be fit, right? So you can get a whole degree in bio, biochemistry or how the body works or kinetics. 
Um, if you want to be a doctor, you have to study a long time to do that. But if you just want to keep your body healthy, you kind of have to learn some very basic principles like, you know, why exercise is important yeah. and why not to live and on a diet of what donuts. works and what doesn't, yeah. And then you have to put it into practice and that's the hard thing. But you still do write the, the creative stuff that you started out wanting to do. I do. And increasingly... Uh, like what? Yeah, so I write um, sort of uh, horror horror fiction often for um, for young younger audiences. Um, at the moment, I'm working on a on a kids animated TV show, which is super super fun. So, um, from a lot of what I talk about in the book is really learning to understand what you want. It's the easiest thing in the world. What do you want? Just work out what you want. It's easy. Um, and then use money as a tool to let you do more of that, right? And it's one of those things you have to be very purposeful about because if you don't, then you'll just spend your whole life on this track of what other people think is important to you, right? Mm. And money just vanishes. So one of the things I identified is that I care about carving out time in my life where I can write fiction because it does not pay any money. <laughs> so that's how I structure my work life now is I structure a work life that lets me take off time where I can, I can write fiction. And it's what makes me really happy. And I think, it, you know, everyone has that thing that just, it, it's pure love um, and, there are so many different ways whether you make that your job and if it's not always feasible to make that your job mm. finding ways to create a lifestyle that can has make room space yeah for what you actually care mm. about and for some people it's making more space for their family making more space for traveling or to start a start a business on the side like mm. everyone has that that thing that gnaws at them have you found that the book and everything that came with it, the, the publicity, the public platforms, uh, has that opened doors that look interesting? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I've been talking to some friends of mine about um, making more content about um, how South Africa's economy works. Uh, so that's been really fun, like going into more of that direction. Um, some of the, the sections of the book that were the most fun for me to write were the ones that were about the context of, of, of South Africa's economy, right? Because a lot of the book is very personal. It's very much about you and what you should do, uh, what you can do. Um, but I think it's important to talk about like, why does our economy look the way it is? Why is it so much harder for some people than others to succeed in this country? And what are the things holding them back? Uh, so that's something that I, I felt like I wanted to explore much more after writing this book. I, I sort of had just like opened a little door and peered in. Um, so I, definitely like there's more things that I, that I want to write mm -hmm. about. There's more things I want to make content about. Um, it's been helpful, uh, you know, in the workspace as well. Now what I do is um, I work as a, as a consultant in the financial technology industry, basically. Um, and I've had, I've had opportunities to work on a lot of businesses that are trying to innovate in the finance space to make the financial world easier for people interacting mm -hmm. with it. Um, mm -hmm. It's opened lots of doors there. Um, it's also just, it's led to a lot of people opening up to me and wanting to talk to me about um, their situation, their lives, um, ask for help. And that's led to some really meaningful interactions with complete strangers. I love it when complete strangers reach out to me actually and they're like, please, can I just write you a whole essay about my life and why I'm so stressed out right now? <laughs> it's quite an intimate and, and yes. yeah, lovely thing. Yeah. And that might, in time, become a book in itself. It could. Uh, personal experiences with yeah. money. It it's could. A wonderful yeah. idea. Yeah. 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 Um, do you think you'll stay in Cape Town? Is uh, you've experienced other places? Uh, as we've said, Rita, one thing I don't have is a plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I I'm extremely happy, um, but I might not. It might not always be the right place mm. for me to be. I, I feel like. Um, it would be very hard for me to leave South Africa permanently. It's in, so thoroughly my home. Um, but And it's know. the the raison d'etre for what you do. Exactly. To a large extent. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Talk to me about <laughs> renting and buying. You have very firm ideas about that. <laughs> um, I think it's one of those things that uh, gets oversimplified. Um, so one of the very few pieces of financial advice that I got growing up, very few, was um, as soon as you possibly can, you have to buy property. Otherwise, you will definitely end up old and dead and poor and alone. Like, definitely. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> Possibly not in that order. <laughs> exactly. Um, but it's one of those things that if you actually run the numbers about, um, is much more complex a question than people think. It doesn't always make sense for people to buy property financially. Sometimes to some people, owning their own home that they live in is just an emotionally important goal. And then that's a very wonderful and important goal. Um, but for people like me, where it's just a source of enormous anxiety, um, I've run the numbers on my own situation. And at least for now, it definitely makes far more sense for me to rent than to buy. Um, because it's dependent on so many factors, where you're living, how long you're going to live there for, um, a number of things and um, but then you have to put away the money that would have gone into that exactly. into that investment into another investment exactly. not just exactly one of the one of the main things that I talk about um, in the book is the idea of a spending ratio so the one number you should always know in your head is what proportion of your income do you spend every month and the trick to, to being wealthy it's the most complicated rule ever is keep that as low as possible if the more of your money that you don't spend and you rather invest it whether you're investing it in property or or in shares in my case, um, that's, that's over the long term how you build wealth. Um, buying property is great for people who think that they lack discipline or don't know how the financial services industry works because it does lock you in. But buying a house is very risky because you're also betting all of your assets on a single, I mean, all, everything you have on one single asset. And often it can go well, but actually stats show that in South Africa for nine of the past 10 years, uh, or over, I'm trying to remember exactly how the stat, stat works. I think it's that over the past nine years, um, house prices or the, the value of people's homes has actually decreased against mm. inflation in most of the country, except for Cape Town, which has been <laughs> ridiculous. <crazy>. Always. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I should have taken not my own advice five years ago and bought a house five years ago. I'd be rich now. So, but this is the thing. It's always a gamble. You yeah. don't know what the future yeah. is. Yeah. And your personal life, um, you have partnered with someone quite recently. How did you meet him? Three years ago, I met him through um, through friends at an incredibly dodgy nightclub. <laughs> and um, how did you, what made you think, a friend of mine describes love at first sight as lust with potential. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, when we go past that, when did you, how did you decide that this was the one? Um, I think we're just like incredibly aligned on the stuff that's really important. We're very different in our interests, but um, we're just very similar people in that both of us care a lot about living life on our own terms. Um, and he's also a person with an incredible social conscience. Um, and he's, he's also just like, I've learned, one of the things I've learned is that what I value in relationships comes down a lot to the small things, the small ways of interacting, the day-to-day -day fabric of how you are with each other. And he's just the most kind person yes. in those interactions. So it's, it's, oh, it's weird. I could, I'm, I'm extremely in love. It's great. Uh, what's great though is, uh, so I, I live in this in this flat in, in, in right in the middle of Cape Town because I hate driving. Um, and I live with him and I live with uh, my best friend as well. And uh, we have two cats. Um, and I think, you know, for young people, uh, a lot of my friends, you know, in their 30s are still living with friends in these sort of almost commune type lifestyles. And I, it's so fun. And I think like we have the opportunity to kind of almost redefine what family is and, you know, now. Uh, and I regard, you know, that unit that's my family. Um, and, you know, Shen, my, my other housemate and I have lived together on and off for a decade. And, you know, uh, we, we co-own cats, so we can never not live together. <laughs> um, yeah. What about sharing space? What about uh, having a room of your own? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I do. <laughs> but um, so there's a lot of really interesting research about happiness, right? And um, this, the general middle class script about like, you know, move out, get married, buy a home, buy a car, have two kids, uh, it turns out to be not be a- Be independent. Be isolated. Mm. It turns out to not often be a very good script for, for happiness. And if you look at, you look at uh, communities where people live longer and report higher lifetime happiness, they're often you know, quite rural communities. They're places like uh, the, the Greek islands, people regularly live to over 100 Scandinavian countries. One thing that all of those countries have in common is a high level of sociability, a high level mm. of community, a high level of connectedness. Exactly. Mm. Mm. Um, and I think it's something that, you know, the narrative of success that we have uh, in, in a capitalist society is, is um, it's really terrible at making people happy. 
Mm. Um, so I think it's it's a, it's a challenge to all of us to think about like, if you go off the scripts a little bit, if you if you think about like you're in control of building the life that you want to, you know, what are the ways that you can do that that will actually give you fulfillness yeah. and satisfaction? Um, and being more connected to friends for me, like my friend family, is one of the things that does that. Yeah. Wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much. <laughs> I've really enjoyed this Thanks, conversation and, awesome. and good luck. Thank you. With whatever comes next. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Rethink your life. It is possible. Until the next time, goodbye.